Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this Lean Pub Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Nate Dixon. Nate is a writer, programmer, and blogger based in Salt Lake City. He's also the author of three Lean Pub books, Painless Vim, Painless Tmux, and his latest book, Painless Git, A Sane Person's Guide to Distributed Development. You can check out Nate's writing on his website at natedixon.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Poginate. In this interview, we're going to talk about Nate's background and career, his professional interests, his books and writing, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience self-publishing. So thank you, Nate, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in uh, technology and programming and, and in writing in, in, in as well. Sure. So let's see. I was born here in Utah. Um, I was born in Provo. I spent my life everywhere. Uh, most of my childhood, I grew up in Idaho. Uh, since then, I've lived in Kentucky, Texas, uh, Alaska, the Philippines, just kind of all over the world uh, before settling back down here in Salt Lake City. I started writing um, forever ago. It was about, I remember in fifth grade, I had a teacher who wrote me a little note and was like, you know, there are good writers, but you are a great writer. And I was a fifth grader. I doubt I was a great writer, but it kind of got me moving on that path. And I was like, oh, cool. That's something I can do. So I kept doing that. Um, I kind of thought that was going to be where I'd end up professionally is just writing and stuff. In fact, I started when I started my undergrad degree, I started as a linguistics major. And when I met my wife, she said, I know four unemployed linguists. I don't want to be married to a fifth. And that's kind of what impelled me to look for something that might be more employable. Um, about that time, I was taking a class that was called Computers and the Humanities. And I found the computer side really, really compelling. I'd always kind of dabbled with computers. My father worked for Radio Shack for years. Um, but this was the first time I'd really looked into programming in any serious extent. And it was fascinating. So I was like, okay, I can do that. I'm going to switch to, to IT. And that was about the time we moved to Alaska. So I was doing online computer classes. And uh, from there, it just kind of grew. I wanted to get back into writing at some point. I never really stopped. I, I don't know if I can just stop writing. <laughs> it's kind of built in. Um, and I got interested in tech writing when, about the time I started writing Painless Vim. So, uh, like I said in the introduction to that book, when I was learning Vim, I was kind of frustrated by the state of Vim education and training. Like, a lot of the most popular books start with, here's 30 years of history about the Vim editor, and before that it was the Vi editor, and before that it was a line editor. And I'm like, I don't care. I just want to know how to save a file and then get out of it without having to shut down my computer. And so I, I looked around a lot and I kind of uh, bugged a guy I worked with a whole lot to get him to help me out because he was pretty good with Vim. And as I was doing this, I thought it'd be really good if somebody wrote something that was, you know, focused on the things you want to know when you're starting out. So that's what I wrote. <laughs> From there, I just kind of kept going with these um I've got a I've got a it's question up. about your um you, you mentioned uh th thanks a lot for that that was a really great story um uh you mentioned um that uh you moved around you've moved around a lot in your life is there a, is there a reason for that <laughs> uh, my dad is a vagabond is most of the reason he just loves traveling it's always been in his blood um so yeah most of the places we lived were just because my dad was in retail people always ask like are you military I'm like, no retail. Uh, we lived in, my wife and I lived in Alaska after we got married because we found that that was a good place to make a lot of money quickly. If you, if you can handle Alaska, there's a lot of opportunity up there. And uh, what is it that you have to handle about Alaska? Um, a common excuse for being late to work in Anchorage is, hey, I can't come in right now. There's a moose standing in my driveway. <laughs> so you have to be able to deal with the wildlife. <laughs> And the weather, um, yeah, you get used to snow banks that are taller than your house. Um, that's interesting what you say to me about um, uh, the snow. Um, uh, I grew up in the province of Saskatchewan in Canada where, you know, a common excuse for being late was my car wouldn't start because it was frozen. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm a little bit familiar with that. Uh, not not so many moose in southern Saskatchewan, but, uh, but a lot of <laughs> snow in winter. Um, uh, and you mentioned that you were taking a course called Computers in the Humanities. 
Um, I'm a little curious about that. When I was, I studied English literature and philosophy in university, and I remember in the, this will date me, but in the, in the kind of mid-90s when I was doing my undergraduate degree, um, there were, people were starting to, I was taking some courses that were starting to relate technology to the humanities. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what your course was kind of trying to get across by connecting computers and the humanities. Yeah, so I got in, I was really lucky on that front because I was there the first semester that my university was doing that. And so the classes, I took three or four, and they were um, kind of a mix between beginning programming and, um, actually that was most of it. They were mostly programming classes for people who were non-technical. And so we had one that was Visual Basic. We had one in a language called Revolution that was basically someone trying to remake HyperCard. And we had one that was Excel, and it was doing Visual Basic for applications in Excel. And they were all very gentle introductions to what you can do with programming, but it was enough to make me say, this is, there's something here. There's something I really like here. Speaking of Excel, I read on your uh, blog that you're uh, doing an MBA right now. Um, <laughs> and you, 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 you're writing about this really, really great post under the title, A Novelist in Business School. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. What, what led you to decide to do an MBA? So that's, um, I've been a programmer now professionally for about oh, 10 years and a bit. And uh, it's enjoyable. It's something I like doing, but I'm, I'm a big part of what I like about my job is the time that I get to spend training other developers. And this is kind of the same thing that makes me want to write these painless books is I like the part where I get to help other people in their careers. And on one of my previous teams, I was the, the designated trainer because I was the one who was like, Hey, I want to do that. And so I spent a couple days, every sprint, like every three weeks, I would prepare some trainings, then I get to present them. And I realized that that was the part I liked the most. And I enjoy development, but what I really want to do is lead people and, and just help people with their careers. So it's kind of where I started looking at an MBA and it helps because right now I work for the University of Utah. So we get some help with tuition for being an employee and that makes life really nice. And the MBA program's right here on campus and that's really nice. So I just figured it'll be a good way to go for my career in general and Hopefully I can stay connected to technology, but start doing the, start participating more in the human side of the equation. And are there any other programmers in your MBA course for you to pal around with? There are a couple, yeah. Um, there's a lot of accountants, and it's interesting how similar our fields actually are and how they, where they overlap in the MBA stuff. Like you look at what accountants are doing in spreadsheets, you're like, this is just code but laid out strangely if you just <laughs> took the logic that you're putting into these excels in a spreadsheet i could drop this into a python file and it would do the same thing it's just a different way of writing it yeah it's interesting you you mentioned that um after i finished my doctorate in english literature i became an investment banker and uh you know started doing a lot of financial modeling and it wasn't until i actually joined up with lean pub uh, a tech, which is you know largely a tech company and i realized you know that what i'd been doing was actually kind of programming um, the skills, the skills. Yeah, it really is. I've got a, so. yeah, yeah. They definitely can transfer if you just, yeah. I'm just saying that it, those skills really do transfer. If you just kind of open your mind to say, I'm not going to be afraid of, you know, the, the blank programming screen. I'm just going to dive in and the same logic applies. Yeah. And the same, uh, one, one typo and the whole thing breaks. <laughs> Very much that. Yes. Um, my next question uh, might be a little bit out of left field, but one of the one of the fun things about this podcast is that I get to talk to people from all over the world and ask them about issues uh, people may have heard of um, about where they're from, but don't normally get to hear a well-informed local talk about. Um, so I've spoken to people in Spain about you know separatist movements and things like that. Um, you mentioned on your website that you're uh, LDS or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, more popularly known as the Mormon Church, uh, and you mm -hmm. also you also mentioned that you're not a Republican, which makes you an oddball. And I, I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't be asking you this question if you didn't also say that in the same place that you love to talk to people about everything. Um, so I wanted to ask you um, why Mormons are typically Republicans. <laughs> So I think where that comes from, I think the intersection there um, 
is in conservative family values more than anything. Uh, one of the things that the LDS Church definitely emphasizes is the family as the central unit of a society. And for a lot of the history of the American political system, the Republican Party has been more pro-family. I don't now again, I'm not Republican. I don't really agree with most of the Republican platform. I'm also not a Democrat. I'm I am I think my political party right now would probably be classified as angry more than anything else. But yeah, I think that's where that comes from is the the emphasis on keeping the family central to society and just traditional family values. Um, I have, growing up, even in my church life, I, one of my scout leaders actually, when I was growing up, was a, called himself a loud and proud Democrat and kept trying to explain to us that, you know, this, there's nothing sacred about the Republican Party. <laughs> there's nothing that we should say is like actually part of our faith. And that's one of the things that, you know, one of the things that Mormons are known for and that musicals get made about is we send our our missionaries out around the world. And I think that serves a couple of purposes. One is to spread the message, but the other one is you get these, you know, white boys from Utah and Idaho and you expose them to a completely different part of the world and a completely different way of thinking and a completely different way of just interacting with people and start to realize that, you know, your little hometown values, not all of them are not all of them spread or not all of them fit around the world. So you have to open your mind and start to see how other people think as well. And um, actually, that, that leads me to my next question. I wanted to ask you, uh, where, where did you go on your, on your mission? That was the two years I spent in the Philippines. So, and that was an amazing experience. Just, I love the Philippines. And so I get to watch, it's been 20 years now, it's dating myself, but I get to watch them, you know, go through... A lot of things. I'm just like I just I'm just pulling for a country on the other side of the world. I don't know what I can do to help, but I want to. Yeah, I saw I saw in your LinkedIn profile that you speak Tagalog, so I was I was guessing that it was the Philippines that you that you'd been to. Um, I'm a little bit curious, yeah. just just not to go on about this forever, but how 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 is your place of for your mission selected? So the the way that works is you submit all of your your paperwork, your application to go on a mission. And it all goes to church headquarters, and there is one day a week where the leadership of the church, it's usually the president of the church and his counselors, um, they've got a room set up with a projector, and it will put up an image of a missionary and their, the, some information about them, and then they decide... Uh, and our faith is that they decide based on revelation that this is where this person should go. And so they put that into the computer and it sends it on through the system. I actually worked for the LDS church for a couple of years. I was never directly involved in that system, but I knew some people who were. And it's really interesting just how quickly that moves. And it, it seems to work. Uh, yeah, and what was the work that you did for the church? I, I, I've read a little bit about it on your profile and your website, I believe. But if you could talk a little bit about that, I think people would be interested to hear what kind of programming one does for a religious organization. Sure. So the LDS Church has, they say, or we say that we've got four main missions. Our missions are to perfect the saints, because we're absolutely not perfect, um, proclaim the gospel, redeem the dead, which is basically doing work for people who weren't able to partake of the gospel in this life and um, help the, I forgot the phrasing now, but it's basically help the impoverished. It's our welfare organization. So each of those four missions has a website and a lot of work that we goes, goes into it. So like perfecting the saints, that's basically everything that members of the church would want on the internet. So that's the LDS.org website. And so that's things like easy access to the scriptures and easy access to lessons and all that stuff. Uh, what I worked on a lot of my time at the church was Mormon.org, which is our public, um, not a member of the church facing website. It's more of our, our missionary website. And that's, you know, answers to questions that people have about our faith and things people want to know. 
Uh, a lot of people know about Family Search, which is our, our genealogy facing website, which is more taking care of getting the whole family of all of humanity put together. And then we've also got a couple of websites that are focused around our welfare efforts. So, like I say, most of my time was spent in the missionary uh, part of the organization. Um, so, I did a lot of things with some of our online teaching programs, like the way that people can chat with missionaries online and the way they can request people to visit or request a copy of the Bible or the Book of Mormon or whatever they like. And that was all stuff that I was working on while I was there. Uh, and and has, has the church embraced social media? I mean, pardon me for being so ignorant, but is, is the church's <laughs> so, social media presence as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, when I was working for Mormon.org, there was... I was there for, I think, three Christmases, and they always do a big Christmas campaign. Well, there'll be a big Facebook uh, campaign, uh, things like Light the World. I think last year one of the things they did is they set up – that was after I'm not working there anymore. But what I saw was they set up, like, vending machines where you can buy, say, a chicken for somebody in a country that – a third world country, someone that could use some help. And so all it is is like you put in some money and it drops a card and then we say, okay, we're going to donate that money to a relief effort in whatever country you assigned. Um, we generally, they'll generally do a big like Instagram campaign around the same time, usually another one around Easter and a lot of Facebook. When I was working there, we were just starting to look at Facebook and Twitter integration and seeing what we could do with that. Um, but yeah, they definitely are interested in just any way that people can bump into the message, like without having to have someone come knock on your door is, is a good thing. Um, I, I promise that we're going to move on to talk about your books, <laughs> your books and your writing very soon. Uh, but, but before that, I have a very selfish question to ask you. Um, uh -huh. you wrote a post about finishing breath of the wild, um, <laughs> the video game, and you had a somewhat similar experience to mine, I think around the same time in, in June where you kind of wandered in to fight the boss uh, accidentally um, and then regretted having finished the game. Uh, yep. And I wanted to ask you what it was about, because I, I actually hadn't played video games for years and then found myself like I couldn't wait until, you know, the time in the evening when I could have a glass of wine and, you know, go to the Hyrule Kingdom. <laughs> and, uh, and it was when I just wanted to ask you <laughs> if it was this very specific kind of connection. What was it about that game that, that you liked so much? Um, to me, Breath of the Wild was such an art piece. There was so much, it was so integrated between the very minimalist sound design and the, the very plain air, very clean art design that was... It was sparse, and yet it was not unpopulated. And it it was very engaging. It was very easy to get drawn into a world where y you could feel connected to it. Like, that's kind of the feeling I got, is I liked going to Hateno Village, and I liked running around. I loved just jumping off a cliff and popping open my parasail and just going anywhere. It's kind of the reason I, I was never very good with horses in that game because I'd be riding a horse for a while and then I'd see a cliff that looked interesting and I'd just go, bye horse, and I'd go jump off a cliff and go somewhere else. Um, but I think uh, it's just so well integrated. Just every part of it fits so nicely with everything else and it felt so organic. Um, I played a lot of that on the train to and from work. I've, we've got a local, it's called Tracks, our local um, light rail here in Salt Lake. And that was the one thing that kind of screwed me up is in some of the shrines, they have motion controls. And I can just tell you that motion control things on a moving train don't work so well. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of shrines where I'm trying to get this ball through a maze. And because of the way the train's moving, the maze is now upside down. And I just, yeah, okay, I'll do that later. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny you say that um, when I, I, I've actually never played it on the the switch device itself that I have, I've, I've only ever played it on the, like on the in docking the machine and on the big, big screen TV. Uh, but when I started playing it, I was getting used to the way on the switch, you can like detach the little controllers and hold one in each of your hands. And mm -hmm. I love that, but it was really, really hard to use things like magnesis. And I thought, cause everything was jumping around and I thought, well, that's, you know, that, that does make it more challenging, but you know, that's, that's a pretty arbitrary way to make the game harder. <laughs> uh, and then I realized it, it thought that like, because of the, I, the, the, the controls weren't connected to the device, 
it thought I was like twisting it and like the, the device was stretching oh. up and down and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, and so when I, when I finally realized what was going on, I was like, oh, now I could actually use these things and shoot arrows. But in any case, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for that great description of what's so compelling um, about that game. Um, I, th I think I enjoyed a lot of, a lot of those uh, same aspects myself. Um, uh, I guess segueing from there, uh, one thing you write about with, with respect to your writing is that you enjoy interactive fiction. Yeah, which is, which is a lot like games. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what what interactive fiction is and, and why you like it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So interactive fiction, a lot of people call it text adventures. That's kind of the name it has from clear back in the 80s when these games first started coming out. And so um, if anybody if people know nothing about interactive fiction except for one word, the word they'll know is Zork, which was an infograms. That's not what they're called. Infocom, an infocom game from like clear back in the 80s. And it's your typical go into a dungeon, get the treasure, get back out. Um, but it didn't end there. And that's the part that interests me, interests me, is that people are still making new and very innovative interactive fiction these days. They're doing a lot of things with just words. And there's an amazing amount you can do. There's an amazing amount that you can portray. Like, I am not a good artist, but I can... I can spend time writing and start to get an image across to somebody through words. So if I want to make a game, and occasionally I might, uh, this is a way I can do it. Um, the language that I found when I was first looking into interactive fiction is called Inform. They're currently on version 7, and um, as you might expect from an interactive fiction language, it's not moving all that quickly. But version 7 is really fascinating to me. One of the reasons I like it and one of the things that first got me interested in it is the fact that in Inform, every statement you make is also a valid English sentence. So it's a programming language that is a subset of the English language. And that makes it a just, it's a very interesting challenge to try and mix my, my linguistic brain and my programming brain and, and do the same thing, like try and mix them into the same place. Um, so... I've played a lot with, I've played around a lot with Inform. It's it's cool because you can just write things like, um, I don't know, office is a room. In the office, there is a desk. On the desk, there is a computer. The computer has a keyboard. And so I'm just describing a room, and you understand exactly what I mean, but so does Inform. If I ran that through the parser, then it would give me a, a pretty little map that says, okay, I've got one room called office and that room has a thing called a desk. And since you told me something's on that desk, I can say a desk can support other things. And, you know, it, it builds its internal picture of the world based off of just English sentences. So just to challenge myself once with Inform, I thought I would try and um, make a, a very small, simplified version of the game Portal. And so... You know, in Portal, you've got a gun that you can shoot a portal on one wall and a portal on a different wall, and then you can move between those two portals. So you can have, like, one on uh, clear across a chasm and one right behind you and just walk through those, and you've crossed the chasm without getting over it. It's like, well, can I do this in text? Can I do this without images? And I spent, oh, probably 40 hours <laughs> working on this pointless little tech demo. And yeah, you can. You can totally do it with just text. Yeah, that sounds really fascinating. Trying to uh, to do something like Portal uh, in text. Uh, what a great project. Um, uh, moving on to your your books. Uh, one of the reasons I was looking forward to interviewing you is that one of the the themes of this podcast, since so many Lean Pub authors are programmers, is that people can can use these interviews to learn about um, the way everything in our world is being built now, because everything is being built uh, with software. Um, and so because of the nature of your book or the sub subjects of your books, I get to ask you um, to explain the tools that, that programmers are using. Um, and so I was wondering, you, you talked a little bit about it before, but could you explain a little bit about what, what Vim is and, and how programmers use it in their work? Yeah, absolutely. So Vim is a text editor, which for a lot of new programmers, you would basically define as a a minimalist or a stripped down integrated development environment. So it's just you and text. And what makes Vim both difficult to learn and very powerful is that for most of the time when you're in Vim, if you press a, a button on the keyboard, 
it doesn't put that letter on the screen. It, that letter, that button is doing something else. So, for example, the, the famous or the most popular four keys for a Vim programmer are H, J, K, and L, because those move you up, left, right, and down, respectively. And so when you're working in Vim, what it's all about is making you faster. But to do that, you've got to learn a whole different way to work. So like if I want to go from line to line, I'll press J or K to move up and down um, to the line I want to be on. And then I can go into what Vim calls edit mode, which is where when you press a key on the keyboard, it actually puts that letter on the screen. So for a lot of people, they're like, why would you mess with this? Why would you waste your time doing that? And the answer is that the people who've been working on Vim have spent decades now being professional programmers and knowing what sort of things you want to do really quickly as a programmer. So like I can, in Vim, you can go to the beginning of a line, uh, press two keys, highlight the next three lines, and then edit the beginning or the end of every line all at the same time. And if you know the, the, magic, the magic keys to press, this becomes really fast and easy. Um, it's gotten to the point where if I'm working in an editor that doesn't have Vim-style controls, I start to get really lost. Like, I have to go and try and, fi try and find the arrow keys on the keyboard again and remember how to use those. So now I will type random strings into the middle of my text because it's, I think it's doing something else, but it's just typing. And it kind of bugs me. It's like, well, D is supposed to delete things. It's not supposed to put a string of Ds on the screen. So, yeah, that was, again, that's why I wrote Painless Vim. I kept hearing people tell me, you know, once you learn Vim, you, you'll never want to go back to anything else because this really is the fastest and easiest way to get around a long text document. And I was like, you know, everyone can't be crazy. These people can't all be wrong. So I'm going to try and figure out why they're right. And I spent probably eight months um, just getting deeper and deeper into it. I was working a lot with Sublime Text, which has a really good Vim emulation mode, as well as IntelliJ, which has an even better, in my opinion, Vim emulation mode. So it was kind of nice because I could do Vim things for a while until like my brain was hurting and I just couldn't handle doing things the weird way anymore. And then I would turn off Vim emulation and I could just work normally for a while. But I got to the point where I started to see those, those speed benefits and those um, performance gains from using Vim. And it, it's now to the point where you know, like I said, I don't ever, I don't ever want to turn off the Vim emulation. I always want to be working that way because it's much faster now. Thanks for that really great explanation. Um, uh, I've known a little, I learned a little bit about it from from uh, researching for this this interview, but that that now I understand a lot better uh, what it is and precisely <laughs> what it's useful for. Um, I was wondering if you could also talk a little bit about what Tmux is. Yeah, so Tmux is. The, the name comes from a terminal multiplexer, which is not much easier to understand. But the idea is that you've got the command line or the terminal on your computer. And so, you know, most programmers, they have to do some things here and there on the terminal, which is just you type in something and hit enter and the computer does something. So what Tmux does is it takes one terminal window and splits it up into multiple windows. So you can have Vim running on the main part of your screen, and over on the side, you can have a process running that is just watching your files, and then every time you hit save, or Vim autosaves, it checks all the files and tells you, hey, you've got an error on line X of this file, or hey, this is not good CSS. And in a, a third window, you can have a real easy way to get into, say, Git, and check your files in, or make sure that you're up to date. So it basically takes the, the command line and turns it into a full IDE. But there's a little more to it that's kind of cooler than that, which is, let's say you're working on a server. So your server is off in a data center somewhere. It's nowhere close to you. Well, if you have Tmux running on that server, you can connect to it and split up your windows remotely. So you've got a command line that you're working directly on that server. And because all you're sending back and forth is just text, um, it's really, really responsive. Like if you were trying to use a, a full GUI on a distant computer, you get some lag and you get some tearing and it just is kind of unpleasant. But if you're doing it via the terminal, 
it stays really snappy and really responsive. And the other cool thing is, let's say I'm working on my server, I'm you know updating the files on production or whatever, and then I'm done for the day. So I can turn off my connection to the server, but my TMUX session on the server stays active. So the next time I connect to that server, everything's where I left it, everything's ready to go. I don't have to go and find my files again. They're all already open and ready for me to start work immediately. Uh, and your latest book that you've just started is called Painless Git. Uh, and for those who are I'm, I'm, for those who are unaware of what it is or maybe unaware of its history, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about Git. Yeah. So Git is a version control system, which means it's a way to make sure that um, every time you're editing your... I'll try again. Every time you make an edit to your code, you can save that and keep those so that if you're, say, writing code at 3 o'clock in the morning and you save it and commit it and then you go to bed and the next morning you get up and like, wow, this is terrible. You haven't lost the good version that came before the 3 o'clock in the morning code. So you can just go back to that. It also means that you can't lose your code as easily. It's One of the benefits of version control is that you can push it to a server somewhere off-site and have everything saved and ready to go. So that if your computer goes down, once you get your computer set back up, that code is still out there and you haven't lost any work. Um, the nice thing about Git is that it works very well for teams. Uh, and I haven't quite gotten into that in my book yet. That's one of the chapters I'm working on. But um, Git, instead of having like one central server that is the source of all truth for the entire team, treats every machine that has a copy of that code as the source of truth. So if there was a catastrophe and your, if Bitbucket or GitHub went down, um, you could rebuild everything from any individual developer's machine and you would have, nothing would be lost. You would be back up and running as soon as everybody connected to that one person's machine. So there's a lot of advantages to using Git. It, it's, I think it's fairly straightforward. Most people get it. But what I've seen is that a lot of people instead of the 80-20 rule where there's like 20% of the functionality is what you'll use 80% of the time, it almost feels like it's a 10-90 a rule where people use about 10% of what Git can do 90% of the time. And when they get to a certain point, they kind of get stuck and then they're like, well, don't know what to do here, so I'm just going to delete everything and start over. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, we could probably do better than that. Yeah, I was going to ask you. I know that you've done you've done quite a bit of work training teams to use Git, and it um, it reminded me of an interview I did uh, a while ago with a computer science professor who was saying that um, essentially getting now now that you know more and more people are getting into programming because it's just becoming a more and more a part of our lives. Um, teaching people version control is, and the importance of version co control is kind of the modern day equivalent of teaching doctors to wash their hands <laughs> uh, because. That's for a long time, we just didn't know that about germs, you know, um, and, and, uh, and I was, I wanted to ask you what, what's, what are the biggest problems that you've encountered, you know, sort of transitioning teams over to, to get. So there's a couple of different ones. One comes from the people who are used to subversion. Um, you know, subversion is an older version control system where instead of having every machine be like a, a full repository like Git, you have one central repository and everybody's machine just saves changes to that. So one of the problems that Subversion had, and this is part of why the Linux Foundation started developing Git, is that uh, it's really easy to get to a place where two people have committed code that's in the same file and now it's a mess, and you've got to try and figure that out, and it's really painful to, to fix that conflict. And so Git has a much easier version, uh, a much easier conflict resolution system. It's newer, it's a little smarter, so it, it can figure out most conflicts on its own. But when it can't, it makes it fairly easy for the developers to fix those conflicts. So uh, the upshot of all this is that people who are really used to subversion they tend to never branch. They tend to do all of their development just in the main trunk branch. And so in Git, that's, that's an anti-pattern. That's the equivalent of coming from the morgue to the maternity ward without washing your hands first, which, you know, that's how they learned that they should wash their hands. And so 
it's that sort of thing. Like it's just the opposite of what you should be doing. So that was that was the first problem you generally have to overcome when you're teaching a new team is you have to take all of the the old seasoned hands and say, you know what, we're doing things different now. And I promise you, as you get into this, it's actually going to be easier. You just you have to trust me a little bit first before before we start getting those benefits. The other problem is the completely inexperienced people who they've kind of learned like, okay, so what I do is I I stage all these files, I commit, and then I push. And then if it goes wrong, they, they start to freak out and just start pushing all the buttons. I had a couple of developers like this on one of the first teams I was training on. And I would come over and I would see like, you, you see the, the list of commits and like, okay, everything's fine, everything's fine. And then you get to the point where they freaked out and suddenly you've got like 10 commits in the space of about 10 minutes. And you're just like, what were you doing? <laughs> and so a big part of what I've been trying to train, especially for new developers, is to calm down and take a breath and step back. Because Git will definitely give you enough rope to hang yourself. Um, and the good thing is it's, it's very rare that you'll ever get things into a state that's so bad that you can't recover from it. But you can get yourself into a state where recovery is going to take a while. And so... You know, if you calm down and think through what you're doing before you do it, you'll you'll save yourself a lot of headache as you fix things. Yeah, um, I, I that no, thanks for that great explanation. Um, it, it's useful for me partly because I I don't do a lot of programming. Um, but uh, when I started learning programming, it was all it was all Git, um, and uh, so that I didn't know I don't know anything else. Um, but one of the things that took me a while to wrap my head around, and then I finally really liked about it was the was the the idea of branching. Uh, when I can just create a branch and go off on my own, then I feel like kind of safe. Like I can't, I don't have to be afraid of screwing up the master uh, code. And that was one of the things that like I found, it took me a while to work my head around it, but I eventually found that that was like one of the, one of the best parts of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I tell people a lot is that branches are cheap. They, they don't take up much space. They don't cause any real problems. You can create as many branches as you want and branch from a branch and then delete them as whenever you want. It's, you know, the more you branch, the safer you are and the easier things are going to work down the road. Um, moving on from the subject of your books to uh, maybe the process by which you wrote them. Um, your current book is is, is 5% done. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I know that you do write books uh, in progress. Um, uh, and, and I know that you directly solicit feedback from readers. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. What, what's that experience been like? It has been absolutely incredible. I have amazing readers. So when I first put Painless Git up, um, I sent out a coupon to all of my readers of Painless Vim and Painless Tmux and said, you know, I'd really love to have your feedback on this one. And almost immediately, uh, someone who had read Painless Vim wrote me and said, hey, the stuff you did in Painless Vim is the reason I'm still using Vim. And do you want feedback? And I said, yes, 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 very much. Yes, please. Yes. And an hour later, I had an email from him. He's like, I've read what you've written so far and I was following through and it's mostly good, but here's the thing that happened that you might not have noticed. And he sent me like a screenshot of what had happened on his system. He's like, you might want to talk about that. And it's like, you're absolutely right. I should talk about that. So I worked that in and it's been the case. That's been the case with all of my books. I've always had readers say, Hey, I like what you're doing, but I noticed this happened. Or, hey, sometimes you can do it the way you said, but here's a way that works better. Or, you know, even, hey, there's a typo on this line. You should probably fix that. And like, yeah, please tell me all of this all the time because it just makes it, it makes my job easier. It makes the book that you're getting from me better. So please, all the feedback you have. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really, we, are, we really love hearing uh, those, those kinds of stories at Lean Pub. Um, uh, one thing I noticed about your books is that they have great covers. Um, that's something that I think all, all self-published authors aspire to. And I just wanted to ask you a little bit if you have any advice about, about how to go about making great covers for your books. Thank you for saying that. That feels so good. So um, my, uh, my philosophy behind my cover and, you know, I've, I've kind of just been copying myself since the first one. But what I wanted was that feeling of, of painlessness that I was trying to get across. So to me, that meant the cover should be open and uncluttered and, you know, fairly simple. Um, the images I choose, I, I'm not an artist, like I said. So all of the images I choose, I, I, buy, the, I buy the rights to off of uh, stock image sites. 
um, you know, I make sure that I got the EPUB rights. And, um, but I like the, for me, I really wanted that theme of this isn't going to cause you stress. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to talk down to you. It's just going to be easy. Um, and part of what I liked about doing the cover design was doing the font design. And again, I, I just, I bought fonts. I'm not a font designer either, but I, I like good typography and I like good layout. And I'm, you know, again, this is not my, my main area of expertise, but it's something that I, I enjoy um, tinkering with. So there's, there's three fonts just on the cover of all of my books, just so they could have the byline look different from the, the subject line and look, have that different from the title, but still have them feel unified. And all, you know, like I said, most of the design work went into Painless Vim. And I kind of mentioned when I sent out my, hey, I'm doing Painless Git email, that that all kind of came together on a Saturday morning in my pajamas because I was like, I really think I can do this. And so I spent four or five hours just looking at fonts and just looking at what would go well together and, you know, grabbing samples and, and just screenshotting samples before I bought any fonts and throwing them into a Photoshop document to see what they looked like together. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of very good cover designs in the world. And mine is one specific style that works for what I'm doing. But um, it feels like we're in a time and a place where minimalism goes a long way. Like staying fairly simple and fairly clean, I think, is very appealing to people in a world that's often very saturated and often very busy. Uh, my last question is uh, that I always ask in these podcasts is um, a self-interested one. Um, and that question is, if there was any one thing about LeanPub that we could build for you or one thing we could improve, um, can you think of anything you would ask us to do? Hmm. Um, so one thing that would be good, and th again, this is a very selfish answer. Uh, one of my most recent posts on my blog was about how I'm handling the transition, like taking my text out of Scrivener and preparing it for LeanPub. And um, one of the things I did is I had Scrivener number all of the files and folders so that it has an intrinsic order to how that should be put in there. And so I wrote a little Python script that creates the book.txt file just out of that directory structure. So now I no longer have to um, hand maintain book.txt. So it'd be great for me if there was a way to just take a, a list of numbered files and folders and just say, okay, read the numbers, and that's the order I want the book in. And, you know, I can see both sides of the argument here like when I was writing painless vim I would often write most of a chapter before I wanted to include it in the book but what I've kind of learned is that um, you know I don't need that pride like it's okay for me to put half finished chapters in the book because that's how I get a lot of feedback from my readers is they tell me you know you're working on this here's something you can do that will make it work better so if I could just take that that one book.txt creation step out of the the process, it would it would speed me up a little bit, and it would mean I don't have to write weird hooks into my Git commit workflow to to make things work without me having to do it by hand. Thanks for that really great uh, and specific feedback. I saw that I saw that article uh, and really really liked it. Um, it's actually we link to it in our help center now. So can I use can I use Scrivener with LeanPub? Um, and so now every any, every <laughs> LeanPub author in the future will get a, get a link link to your post and and learn from it. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, and thanks very much for taking the time to do this interview and for being game to answer questions from everything from religion to video games uh, <laughs> and for your great explanations of these tools that, that programmers use in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so thank, and thanks uh, also for being a LeanPub author. Oh, thank you. I've just, I love LeanPub and I, I'm glad to talk and this has been a great experience.